Okay, so welcome back everyone. I guess most people are uh, back from Gather Town. We just made half a minute to people rejoin the Zoom. Okay, all right, so the last lecture of today is by Mukunta Gangamani, who will tell us about ADS-CFT. Go ahead, Mukund. Thanks, um, and uh, thanks to both uh, Veronica and Tom for putting together TASI and for Oliver um, Eaton and Tom DeGrand for all the hosting, albeit virtually. Um, so um, I was tasked with uh, talking broadly about ADS-CFT correspondence, mostly to set the stage for what's to come in the upcoming weeks. And um, so I'm going to start at the very, very beginning um, in the, uh, from the 90s or before and work my way towards uh, uh, some general statements. Uh, I, I put up my rough outline and uh, how far we cover that will very much depend on how, how much interaction there is. So feel free to please um, interrupt me at various times if something is unclear or something is uh, you'd like more explanation. Um, I, I chose very specifically to try to not do too much overlap with upcoming lectures. You're gonna have many um, lectures on um, in quantum information and uh, quantum information aspects of holography. Yeah, and um, I'll try to steer clear of that discussion to a large extent, partly to focus on other interesting aspects of area CFT that have been uncovered in the last two and a half decades or so. So today I mostly want to start, go back to aspirations people had in the 60s and 70s of how to study uh, strong interactions and uh, go back to the idea that large and field theories in some sense has something to do with strings and how the, the arguments that led uh, Malasena to come up with ADS-CFT correspondence are rooted in that scheme of things. So initially I'll start with large n, then I'll divert a bit and sort of uh, talk a bit about the decoupling limit in, in string theory and then use that as a uh, jumping point to set up the general discussion of what um, the correspondence is and what the basic entries in the dictionary are. Uh, tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit about what we can compute from the, uh, mostly in the vacuum. Uh, we'll then move on to talking about um, physics in excited states. And uh, depending on how things go from there onwards, we'll either talk about probing geometry and what we might sort of use as a stepping ground for um, understanding how geometric reconstruction should be uh, encoded in field theory. And finally, some uh, open questions and sort of other areas of ADS CFT that have been discussed in the, in the past uh, decade or so. All right, so let's step, start with talking about large end field theories. And, and here I mean something quite general. So let's just talk about field theories um, with um, tensor valued fields. They could be vectors, matrices, or general tensors. And we have models of interesting models of all kinds. And so the classic example is basically just Young Mills with the Grandian density is a squared, where F lives in the adjoint, the field strength lives in the adjoint of the gauge group. And we'll take the gauge group for simplicity to be just UN. We could talk about SUN by just removing one element of the trace. <clears throat> so F is an N by N matrix. So this is matrix valued, or we could have um, something like uh, uh, the vector ON model, 
where the Lagrangian I can take to be phi is a vector in ON and I can take uh, some quadratic interaction and um, let's say lambda phi to the fourth theory with um, phi dot phi squared. The third example, which is has been around for a while, but has come, come into recent interest are theories with tensors um, where you could have a Lagrange, where you could have a field, let's say uh, with a canonical kinetic term, with Q indices, and a potential, which I'll just denote as phi to the Q, where this is some particular, I'll write it down in a second. So with some appropriate co contraction of the Q indices of, of uh... Now, in all these cases, what we really care about is the fact that there is an additional label, the label being the, the, the number of fields. And we want to study this sort of large species limit where our fields are, are, are we have a large number of species. But for that to make sense, we need that large species limit to have sensible limits. And from a practical point of view, what we would at least like is if you're trying to do perturbative analysis of this large, of, of this large number of fields, we have some control where we could imagine that a, a truncation to a, for, for us to be able to focus on a subset of uh, interactions or subset of Feynman diagrams, if you will, if you're computing perturbative Feynman diagram calculus. So for, for this analysis, for example, we could, so for the purpose of discussion, while I set these up as field theories and they could live in many dimensions, in order for the large end to analyze what happens in the large end limit, I don't actually need to know the details of what the dynam of what the what dimension I mean, what, what what the what the Feynman diagrams evaluate to, but rather just study the combinatorial structure of the Feynman diagrams. So I might as well forget about the spatio-temporal dependence of these fields and focus very simply on a zero-dimensional field theory with tensor valued field, field indices. Okay, so we'll focus on combinatorics. And this for this, it suffices to truncate to so, so zero dimensional quantum field theory, basically just integrals. What we are after is we're looking for large end limits where truncation to a subset of diagrams is possible. And I'm not a priori requiring that the theory be solvable in a large end limit. I just require that I be able to truncate and focus on a subset of diagrams. In fact, as I'll argue for you, the large end matrix models are not necessarily solvable if you have more than two, more than one matrix. <clears throat> and these three class of theories, each of them gives rise to different large end limits. The first one gives rise to the famous Toft large end limit of focusing on planar diagrams, which is the case we will primarily discuss through the course of the lectures because that's the case we seem to understand best from ADS-CFT. The vector ON models are give rise to large end limits into involving bubble graphs. They are solvable, but they are mostly free. They have, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll describe them in, 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 in um, perhaps 
a little bit today and perhaps a little bit at the, fi the final day. The tensors, on the other hand, uh, they, they do give a, a leading large end saddle point that seems to have some resemblance with holography. This was discovered not just in the tensors, but also the class of diagrams that dominate for these tensor models also show up in the disordered SYK model, for example. But there's no systematic understanding of the large end counting for the tensors, as far as I'm aware, that tells you how to organize the sub, sub leading um, diagrams beyond the leading order in some useful form. So, so let's focus on, on the matrix models. And we can adapt since we have fields are matrix valued. I'll just call them phi AB. We can just focus on a, um, uh, a model which I can just truncate my theory to this simpler Lagrangian. You can think of phi as a proxy for the young males field strength. And I will normalize this Lagrangian as follows. I'll strip off all the couplings. Let, let's say for, for, for simplicity that this is really like a truncation of young males theory where the cubic and the quartic couplings are set by the same scale. And I've really scaled the field so that I can pull out an overall um, factor of G and mean squared, which I'm just calling G here, and, and scaled up and down by N for reasons you'll see. The way you organize this is either by drawing the TOF double line notation, where you draw propagators with the indices as shown, and then the interaction vertices are basically given by these ribbon graphs. So the cubic vertex is just this, and you can write down the quartic vertex. But we could write down the diagrams and try to ask what diagrams dominant, dominate at the large end limit and which ones are subdominant. And for that, for that, for that discussion, we don't need to do very much. We just need to sort of eyeball this Lagrangian and see that the fact that the, there's an overall factor of um, in, in front of the Lagrangian. So the vertices and the propagators are set by the same scale. The vertices scale like this, this, um, this factor, the propagator scales like the inverse of this, fa of this factor. Sorry, so can call... I ask a question? Certainly, go ahead. I, I think I just missed something. So the Lagrangian that you just wrote down here, you said it was a, it, it's somehow a truncation and a repackaging of the Yang-Mills Lagrangian. I, can, can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So let's go back to the Yang-Mills Lagrangian. So what's crucial here is that if you think of the Yang-Mills Lagrangian, the, 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 the crucial fact is that I have a, I have a, tra I have a single trace interaction but F is a matrix valued object. If I wrote it back in terms of the gauge potential, uh, we would write the Lagrangian with a, so that F is dA minus A commutator A. So when I expand it out, I would get a term which is like A squared. I'd get a term which is A cubed from the commutator from the kinetic term. And then I'd get a term which is A to the four but they're all sitting inside the same trace. So I could just as well truncate it down to one field, which is matrix valued and write down three sets of couplings, which are basically five squared, five cubed and five to the four. This okay. is in zero dimensions, right? So they're, they're this is in zero dimensions. That, that's why they're under derivatives. That's right. So, I mean, the, 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 if, they, if I'd forgotten about the derivatives, I would have just gotten just A to the four in, in yes, young male theory, but I'm just, since I'm only interested in combinatorics, I, I, don't, I don't want to worry about the derivatives. We, we could keep track of the derivatives, then I just have to write propagators with 
you know, either in momentum space or write down the positions were that, that, that those details, which, which are not going to matter for my counting. Good. Keep the questions coming, please. That, that's very helpful. But, but now you see, see the advantage of doing this is that we can say that the propagators They scale like g squared n over n. And I'm just going to call g squared n lambda by definition. So this is lambda over n. My vertices, they scale like n over lambda. And so far, nothing has happened. So, so far, this is just re repackaging data, no, nothing happened. The key point where something happens is when we start doing loops. And why? Because our fields carry an index. So each time a field runs in a loop, it's traced over, which means I get a factor of n. Okay, so each loop Okay, I shouldn't say field loop because that could mean either the double line or a single line. Let me just say each loop gives a factor of n. So now we can just count. So if I have a diagram, a general Feynman diagram, we could write down the diagram and then count how many vertices, propagators, and loops we have and try to organize the diagrams by their end count. As I said, our requirement for the end counting to work is for some diagrams, for there to be a good organizational principle for this combinatorics to make sense. Some diagrams should dominate and there should be a systematic way to understand the things that we're throwing away. Okay. Let's do this by looking at uh, vacuum diagrams. So no external links. What would be the count? Well, the simplest one is just the bubble. And then you could try to draw, so there's a th three vertex and we could try to draw other things. But let's just, let me leave the counting, let me leave the drawing for you as an exercise and just do the counting for you by saying that we can organize a graph has some number of edges, some number of vertices, and loops are basically faces, so, and some number of faces. Let's call this E, V, and F respectively. And if I get such a graph, I can just do the counting immediately. So I get a factor of lambda to the e minus v n to the power v plus f minus e. The edges are propagators. So lambda over n to the power e comes from those propagators. The vertices have give you a contribution of n over lambda and the faces give you a factor of n, which faces are just the loops. But so these are two dimensional graphs. So that, so v plus e minus, v plus f minus e for close, for, for close so is basically given by the gauss bonnet theorem is just two minus two g where G is a genus of surface. 
So let me write this as saying that the free energy I can organize as follows. I can organize it in powers of n, where the powers of n are simply set by the genus, which is a topologically invariant, times some function associated with the genus of this coupling constant, which is this rescaled coupling constant, which I've called lambda. Okay. But now the n counting is very clear if I hold lambda fixed. If I hold lambda fixed, then I'm scaling g uh, by a factor of one over root n then it's clear that diagrams with genus zero dominate over diagrams with genus one, which in turn dominate with diagrams over genus two, et cetera. So we see that the, the perturbative expansion of this theory has a nice planar diagram expansion where the planar diagrams dominate over everybody else. As I said, I'm still not requiring solvability. So I don't make a, any claim yet that I can determine Fg of lambda. In fact, I don't even make a claim that I can determine F0 of lambda. Nevertheless, this was Toft's idea of trying to solve pure QCD, pure young mills theory, by trying to see if you can take large n limit and truncating the theory to studying just the planar diagrams. Okay. The fascination, of course, is then that here you have, starting from a matrix model, you've constructed a very simple genus expansion, which of course is tantalizingly similar to the genus expansion of perturbative string the world shape theory. So one may hope that there is a way to connect this matrix model counting with some kind of World sheet string theory. And this hope has been around since the early 70s, where people felt that the one way to solve QCD is to find the world sheet dual of the, of, of, of the confining string. Yeah. We don't know what that is. There have been various attempts, but for the non-supersymmetric theory, we don't know what the world sheet dual is. However, that exploration in, in rather indirectly inspired the area safety correspondence because once we upgrade this discussion to supersymmetric field theories, we do know what the string theory is. Okay. Let me say a few words about the large end counting um, for, for, for matrices before talking about the other examples because I will use them in, in what's to come. But let me pause here before I do that to see if people have any questions about just the counting in, in the matrix for the matrix model. No? Okay. So some general statements. So I only talked about um, the vacuum diagrams, but we can talk about correlation functions. And now I have to decide what kind of operators I want to talk about. So I'll talk about single trace and multi-trace operators. So if you think of the fields as alphabets, the single trace operators are, are words made out of uh, these alphabets that, 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 form, that form a single word. The multi-trace operators are like the word multi-trace, they're hyphenated, they're multi-concoctions -con 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 of multi-word multi phrases. 
So, so single trace operators example would just be trace pi squared or trace pi to the n. And multi-trace operators would be things like trace pi squared, pi cubed. And I have to distinguish this because each trace, remember, gives me a factor of n. So the n counting for single trace is different for the n counting for multi traces. The first statement I'll make is the following. For single traces, Correlate as factorized. If I try to compute the expectation value of trace, let's say, O, which is some, some triangle trace operator, and with itself, then this is. What this means is really the following, that if we go back to our discussion, our Lagrangian, we took to be n over lambda times single trace. With lambda fixed, one over n is the effective edge bar. Of the theory. The so theory classicalizes in some sense that you sort of see that this correlator is factorized because the, the interaction sort of are down in powers of one over n. In practical terms, it means the following. We'll, I'll, I will always normalize single trace operators to have unit two point function in n counting. So they're n to the zero. Uh, maybe I won't say unit, because I'll just say order one two point function. Then the connect the connected part of of k point function scales like n to the two minus k. If you think about this, what this means from the point of view of interactions, it means that high point correlators are down in the one over lane limit. There's a corollary here, and that corollary is that you, for the large end limit, makes sense. Not only do you want some di diagrams to factorize this way, the, the, the planar diagrams win, but you also want OPE coefficients to be suitably well behaved. You want the OP coefficient to also scale suitably in the one over n limit because if you have lots of fields, you could imagine that I have many channels of interactions. And if my OP coefficients grow, then this would not be true. For multi traces, We need to suitably scale them 
to have sensible large n limit. So I claim that for double traces, you need to scale them as, you need to have scale them with a one over n um, for a double trace coupling. Otherwise, you won't have a sensible large n limit. So you can, you can intuit this very quickly by realizing that there are two factors of n um, in, the two, in the two traces, which has to be removed, with one factor has to be removed to be comparable to the Lagrangian, which is built out of single traces. So, sorry, can I ask a question about the previous slide? Is it is it easy sure. to is it is it easy to uh, get this n to the two minus k? Is it is it easy to see it? Yeah. So, so the way I, I like to see it is you you just try to draw, you know, take your operators, and then you try to draw uh, this double line picture. So I, I didn't draw it in detail, but you take, you know. Let's let's try to do this. Let's say you want a three-point function of, um, you know, trace x squared, trace x, trace five squared, trace five squared, trace five squared. The way, the way I would do it is I would just draw the three, the two phi's. Each has two legs. Right. Yes. Okay. Now you try to connect them. Okay. Let's see let's how many loops are there. Just count the loops and see see how some ways to connect them and and just see that immediately you get into two, two minus. Okay. Thanks. And the same thing here for the multi traces. The, the same same counting goes. Now it's just that each each instead of the, the single multi-trace behaves like a composite. So you sort of keep it together and then you get a factor of one over N because otherwise you have many more loops going out from one, one corner, one, many more lines going out of one corner because there's two traces in this, in this lot. Let, let me, so, so something else that is quite nice I won't get to discuss this, but something you should be aware of is that for most purposes, I will only talk about single traces. I will mention a few things about double traces, which are important for closure of OPE in ADS safety. But if you go back to our motivation, if you, if you wanted to study, for example, um, um, QCD, where you may also have fundamental fields, you could mix matrices, a joint valued, um, potent, gauge potentials and field strength with fundamental valued quarks. And um, you, can, you can run the counting for that problem too. Except that now in this theory, you, mean you don't have just, when, when in, in real QCD, when, when, when you have confinement, you don't have just gluons, but you also have baryons. Now baryons are made out of determinants. And if you have a quark with n legs, the determinant is composed of n, so n families of quarks. So we could talk about more complicated operators like determinant operators or subdeterminant operators and so on and so forth. These are composed of n fields. So they're actually quite heavy in the large n limit. So, so baryons in QCD are like this, baryons in large n QCD. And these are not perturbative. Because our H bar, remember, is one over N. So these gadgets are non-perturbative in our effective H bar. There's a very nice phenomenology of this. And this goes back to, um, so let, let me give you some references. 
So my favorite reference for um, La Gen is, um, is Coleman's book. Uh, the chapter is called One Over N in his book on um, uh, his, his Ericia Lectures book, uh, Aspects of Symmetry. And, uh, and there's a very nice discussion of uh, variance and phenomenological aspects of La Gen in um, a Witten's paper from 78 or 79 called uh, Variance uh, in La Gen. The reason I bring up variants here is that in the ADS-CFT, this language, this non perturbative nature of these variants will be very clearly seen. They will correspond to deep brain states in the bug. Okay. Whereas the single trace operators and the double tra multi-trace operators will correspond to single particle states or multi-particle states of gravitons or other excitations in ADS, the variants are not they, they really need to know string theory. They, they, they come from deep brain states. Um, I believe it is a fun exercise um, to try to figure out how baryon operators should be now uh, scaled within. Just remember they're built out of uh, n objects and it's a determinant, so there are factorials involved. So the, the scaling is quite non-trivial to work out. Uh, in fact, as far as I know, the scaling was only correctly worked out in early 2000s in a paper that has the most fantastic title that I know. <clears throat> okay, so that's what I want to say about uh, large and matrix models. Let me pause here to check if people have questions before I switch to a few words about the vectors and uh, tensors. Um, I have one question. I think I missed something. So is the determinant operators an example of the multi-trace operators or is it independent? So yes and no in the following sense. So if you think of a determinant, it is a multi-trace in the sense that if you expand it out, if you expand the determinant in terms of traces, you, you will see the relation in terms of combination of traces. Now the question is, are you going to see trace relations or not? If you have finite n by n matrix, at some point you get cut off because you get the fact that the determinant is there and there are trace relations beyond some point. But the limit we're trying to imagine is n is really taken to infinity. So trace relations are down in one over n. So in that sense, I think we should treat the variance as separate objects. But, but, but they're really high, high order multi-trace in that sense. But, but yes, that's a good point. Thank you for okay, let me say a few words about vectors. So if I go back to my, the model I introduced, uh, um, the lambda phi to the four like model. There's a canonical trick to solve this, which is to basically use the, use the fact that the phi to the four interaction can be made Gaussian by hubbard stratonovich trick. So let's introduce some auxiliary field. What do I want to call it? Let's call it chi. And let's re rewrite this as okay, I'll, I'll be sloppy about my science. Factors, think of this as phi dot phi. Okay. And then you can integrate out phi because phi is now Gaussian and, and you can write an effective action for chi. In fact, the standard trick here 
is to integrate our angles. Just write phi as its norm times um, some direction angles. And integrate all these mu vectors. And the diagrams that dominate are simple bubble chains. So that's why the theory is actually very simple. So the iteration proceeds very straightforwardly. So the classic example of one of these one of these theories would be. The, the Wilson Fisher theory in three dimensions, which is the fixed point of phi to the four in the infrared. But once you take large n, you could study the theory perturbatively because again, one over n gives the effective perturbation count. Okay. I'll come back to this um, and talk about large n vector models and duals towards the end because those duals, as far as I know, don't have any string theory realization. In that limit, because the large end theory is almost Gaussian, you get an infinite number of con almost conserved higher spin currents. So these large end theories are actually nearly free field theories. So they're described in terms of higher spin theories in ADS. I don't know how to embed them in string theory, although there are interesting classes of theories, uh, which, which I'll describe, which can interpolate between these vector-like theories and matrix-like theories, okay? But let me, let me table that for now uh, as uh, uh, an interesting example of large n, but just remark that this is a rather simple large n limit, which doesn't share the richness of the matrix examples. The last example, the last class, which I'll mention, and uh, are the so-called melonic examples. And I didn't write a Lagrangian, so let me take uh, a three index tensor. No symmetry properties, let's call it phi ABC. Hi, uh, sorry. Can I ask a question regarding the vector models? Sure, go ahead. Um, do you have any um, geometric intuition why those uh, bubble chains should be dominant contribution? The same way that we have like the planar graphs for the matrix models. Yeah, so roughly yes, because you see once I, all the factors of N are just in this direction cosines. Okay, so once I integrate all these mu's, then this uh, um, norm of the field and chi, which is the collective field, they have a very simple counting in N. So N, there are various N factors that will come wherever you see, for example, wherever you see phi dot phi, when you integrate out the pieces, you'll see factors of N. And then it's a matter of just asking what diagrams dominate because then the, the, you just see these diagrams surviving. I don't have a better way of saying it apart from graphically just drawing the pictures and checking what happens. Mm -hmm. But if someone has a better intuition, let me know. Okay, thank you. So here, let me take an example of a three index tensor, no particular symmetric, symmetry properties. And so my kinetic term was just the canonical kinetic term, but for potential, I'm going to pick a particular contraction of these indices. So let me pick this, let me write it and then explain what I did. <clears throat> 
I'm picking indices and contracting in a very particular way across four, four of these fields. So let's, let's draw this and see what's happening. So I'll draw this with three colors just to indicate the three indices. So let's call this A, B, C. And the potential structure is like this. It, the, the indices are contracted in a very particular way. So the first two have their first index contracted, the second two have their first index contracted, and the, the first and third have the third, second index, second and fourth have their second index contracted, and the first and the fourth and the second and the third have their third index contracted. These are not quite planar. This, this interaction vertex already is non-planar, but Something remarkable happens that the leading large end diagrams Sorry, Mukun. Yeah. Um, is the second B2 supposed to be A2? Sorry, the second B2 is supposed to be A2. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, so I, I, the way I think about it is, you, you contract the first with the first index of the between the first two objects. Then you take the second index of the first object and contract to the third guy, the third index of the first object with the fourth guy, and then cycle through. So, leading large end diagrams in this case are something like follows. Suppose you're computing. In this case, let's say compute propagator corrections. So cubic diagrams. So you just get sunsets and iterated sunsets. Or people like to call them melons. And and so on, but these diagrams can be resummed. They can be geometrically resummed and, and they give a truncated Schwinger Dyson set that allows you to solve the theory completely to, 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 this, to leading a large in order. This is the same, this structure was known to people who are studying tensors for the point of, from the point of view of uh, analyzing them as interesting theories of gravity, but they were revived post uh, SYK because the SYK um, model also has the same subset of diagrams dominant. In SYK, the reason for these diagrams dominant is, is due to the fact that we do disorder averaging. The disorder contraction between the, the, the ver in, interaction vertices that Douglas will talk about probably next week gives you the, uh, a truncated Schwinger Dyson set, but not so uh, for, but this in this case, you're not doing any disorder averaging. Uh, but it's just the way the index contraction has been set up that you get a truncated set. As I said, in this case, I don't know of a systematic study of the theory in, in, a, in, in large n. I also don't know if they, even if there is one, what the corresponding dual would be in any sense. Okay. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, this was well covered in uh, the TASI lectures from 2015, I believe by Klebanov. No, 2017 by Klebanov. And um, so there's a very nice review, review article by um, Igor and friends from that time. Okay, so that's all I want to say about um, this class of um, large n counting. Let me again pause to see if there are questions and um, we'll then um, 
go back to the matrix models because those are the class of theories that I know how to engineer in, in string theory. Very good. So let's take this fantasy seriously. Let's take the fantasy that, you know, there is a close connection between the genus expansion of um, perturbative Feynman calculus of large and matrix models and some kind of string theory. Okay. Let's try to reverse engineer it, which is sort of um, uh, in, a, in a alternate history, and and realize where we could ask where we if if we had to get them where would we get them from, and so we could try to engineer gauge theories in string theory. But there we have it easy because the D brains do that for us. So, the world volume theory of D brains is, uh, is your engage theory. Okay, it has additional stuff, it has supersymmetry, it has um, additional adjoint valued fields, et cetera, et cetera. But insofar as counting, as I, as I argued, insofar as counting is concerned, and insofar as planar dominance is concerned, those details are irrelevant. So we might as well see what we can get by, by studying these things. And historically, this is not how people tried to, people didn't try to constructively engineer uh, large and gauge theories in string theory and study um, gauge gravity duality, but rather they did two different calculations that showed striking agreement, which post facto led to realization by Malasena that there must be something deep relation by why this is working. And the two calculations are the follows. So let's take type to be as an example, let's take type two B string theory. In 10 dimensions. I, I can't hear you. I don't know if anyone else that's happening for us. You can't hear me. Interesting. I can still hear. I can okay. hear you. I can also okay. hear. Good. Um, if the person who can't hear me, can you can you still not hear me? I didn't see who that was. Oh, maybe you still can't hear me, so. Yeah, it seems all right. So it may be a local issue for them. Okay. So let's look at type two strings in 10 dimensions and look at D3 brains. Actually, I, I'll use it as a local model. Later on, I'll generalize to talking about type two strings probing various uh, other manifolds with D3 brains. And, but the local model always is true because we can locally zoom in near the, what we're going to really do is zoom in near the D3 brains. So we're gonna have ND3 brains. And as, Polchinski taught us these D3 brains are boundary, provide boundary conditions for open strings. And their strings stretch between various D brains. And the fact that the strings stretch between various D brains at the end of them, this is what gives you the matrix structure of these open strings. So the open strings which describe the fluctuations of these D3 brains. Um, 
But then there's this ambient space time where there are closed strings readily propagating. And these closed strings interact with the deep brains and in particular interact with the open strings. So there's one picture where I have so dynamics is described by the open string action, the bulk closed string action, plus some open closed interaction. What I can try to ask in this picture is I can try to do a classical computation where I think of some, some, some analog of the Rutherford problem. I, I think of these D brains as a target and I try to ping it with a closed string state and ask how much of the closed string wave function gets absorbed. So we could try to compute absorption cross-section for closed strings. And we'll do this at low energies. So just low frequencies, closed string states thrown at, the, at this D-brains. At low energies, I can look at the open string states. They're organized as any world sheet theory into maskless open strings plus, which are the, which in this case are just the gluons and the transverse excitations of the D-brains and the associated fermionic degrees of freedom. And the higher stringy excitations, which are which have a scale of alpha prime. So I'm going to look at energy scales which are small compared to alpha prime. So I can, I can assume that I'm not throwing enough energy in my closed strings that excites the massive open strings. If I do that, then I could compute this absorption cross-section by doing a world volume computation. basically compute the DBI action in plus vertices from with uh, coupling to bulk. The DBI action already has this because it has a pullback So the D3 brain action that I will study is basically some the D3 brain tension times the piece coming from the, the dilaton cup, which is in the closed stream. have the world volume scalars and world volume uh, gauge potential, gauge fields. This calculation is a very standard quantum field theory calculation because we really have the energies all impinged on, let's say, let's say we throw in a scalar gra uh, dilaton state, we don't even throw in gravitons. Then it's just a question of asking how does the dilaton couple and decay into excitations running along the brain? So this is just a decay computation in, in, um, in quantum field theory. And I'll tell you the answer of this computation that was done in the nineties. You get an answer, which I will actually write out the factors. And tell you where these factors come from. 
let's forget about the pi's and twos for a second. This n squared comes from the fact that there are n squared decay channels because it's an n by n matrix. The gs squared ls squared, um, uh, sorry, this is not ls squared, this is ls to the eight. These factors come from the, the, the D3 brain tension squared. Okay. This is the cross section. So the, these factors come from D3. And omega cubed is then there for dimensional reasons as the, basically the sort of the, the absorption cross section goes to zero as omega goes to zero at the rate given by omega cubed. So this calculation never made any use of any geometry other than flat space geometry. It just tried asking, if I throw a closed string onto a deep brain, with what probability does, what the absorption cross section of it, with what probability did it get absorbed? And that probability was converted into a cross section. But there's something important about deep brains. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you repeat what omega is and why? Omega is a frequency. Oh, sorry, omega is a frequency of the impinged uh, dilatonic state. So I'm just saying that I, the energy dependence of the cross section is omega cubed. The remaining factors can be understood as kinematical coming from the structure of the D3 brain action and, and uh, the number of species decay channels available. So uh, I wanted to show this picture again. The one important thing in this discussion is that this this made use of this made no use of any other detail apart from the fact that the low energy theory on the D brain is described by DBI and that DBI action tells you how the open strings are coupled to closed strings. But there's one more statement, which is that this opens this D brains, they carry energy and they carry charge under Ramon Ramon fields. Because the closed strings contain gravitons, anything that carries energy will back react and deform the geometry. Okay. So we could ask a different question. Is there a closed string background? with the same macroscopic charges as ND3 brains. Okay. And the answer is yes. And the answer was yes, before Polchinski understood D brains as D brains, this answer was known in supergravity um, by, and it was first worked out by uh, Horowitz and Strominger. And this is the extremal black three brain geometry. With metric This function of H far and let me again write out this fact of R. Mm -hmm. 
it's again related to the D3 brain tension and times N. And this, this solution is supported by a self-dual phi form, which is dH inverse which dt with dx. Uh, one plus one. It's self-dual, so let me just write it as a self-dual form. Star in 10 dimensions. Uh, <clears throat> this solution, if you think of in analog, an analogy with extremal rice and some solution, except it's not supported by uh, a one-form potential, it's supported by four-form potential. So it's living that the, it's a brain solution with uh, a longitudinal space, which is R Minkowski space R3 comma one and a transfer space, which is just R6. And I've written the solution in isotropic coordinates. So the horizon um, in this case is at R equals zero. Actually, this solution, as it stands, is a pretty remarkable solution. It's, it's completely singularity free and uh, you can work out its maximal analytic continuation. It's just many copies of what looks like. It, it's, it's, it's Penrose diagram looks like the extremal right to Nordstrom Penrose diagram with no singularity whatsoever anywhere. But the solution, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that matters is that it's asymptotically Minkowski. And as you go near R equals zero, it develops a throat. And the near throat region is ADS by process. Okay. This is just think of the extremal rise to Nordstrom, which also has uh, an infinite throat and down the bottom of the throat is an ADS2 cross S2. In this case, it's just because we're in, we have a, a, a brain, the ADS2 has been converted in ADS5 and the transfer space is just the, is the, is the spherical directions in the transverse R6. Okay, so, we could try to ask the following question, which was the other question that was asked in those days. In this, in this way of thinking about it, there are no deep brains, okay? The deep brains are gone. They have been dissolved into this five form flux. In our previous picture, we had N D3 brains and the only relic of the fact that there is N D3 brains is that the five form flux is quantized and the integral over the S5 of the five form flux is there. Okay. So if it weren't for this five form flux, the solution would collapse, but the flux is what's holding this space from collapse, this S5 from collapsing. Excuse me. Now in this solution, you could ask, it looks naively like I have three regions I have a region which is far away where the closed strings propagate have made a leap. That region should be analogous to the large radius distance away from the D3 brains. This another sort of what you might call, want to call the atmosphere zone where the closed strings try to impinge on the D brain, which is the throat. And then there is this sort of analog of the D3 brain themselves, which in this case has been replaced by this near horizon ADS five times S5. So let's do a calculation. Let's try to ask in classical relativity, what is the absorption cross section of a black brain geometry if I throw in uh, a dilaton of frequency omega? And so you can just do this classical scattering calculation. 
and lo and behold, you get an answer. Mukund, okay. you have five minutes. I have five minutes, okay. Thanks. Which is exactly on the nose up to factor of two pi, the same as the answer computed using the DPI action. So it seems logical to argue the following. To split our previous discussion of open and closed strings and their interaction, give them geometric avatars and say they belong to these three regions of space-time. If that's true, this is the low energy absorption cross section, then we could do the following. We could attempt to decouple the near horizon region from the asymptotic and the way we would do this is by the decoupling limit that Maldasena described. Which is to take this radial coordinate, which I'll just describe in slightly non coherently. I'll zoom in by taking this radial coordinate to zero while keeping R over LS squared fixed. And in that limit, all that happens is that you get to drop this one from this harmonic function. And you zoom in exactly on ADS micro S5. And you'd like to associate that with the physics of the open strings. At this point, I haven't said that I get classical gravity in ADS time S5. This solution is a solution of full string theory. And all I've said is I get closed strings propagating on ADS micro S5. That closed string theory propagating on ADS5 plus S5, I would like to identify with the physics of open strings living on the D3 brings. That's a zeroth order statement of duality. We can go one step further, try to decouple the massive string modes, the massive closed string modes and truncate this, the theory of closed strings here to the theory of the massless closed strings, i.e. the gravitons and other excitations on this ADS5 cross S5 geometry. And that would describe a particular limit of the, op of the Young Mills theory on the D3 brain geometry, on the world model. Okay. So the claim is going to be that for large n, we, we'll see why we need large n in this case, and we'll see why we need to have strong coupling. We'll need large n to make sure that we're not doing quantum gravity. We're doing classical string theory or classical gravity. And we need strong coupling to make sure that this classical gravity is not, we, we get classical gravity and not the full classical string theory. Okay. So, I'd hope to do a bit more today, but uh, at least I've set up the stage and tomorrow I'll start from here, set down the dictionary, see what the generalizations are apart from this AD3 brain example, and then build up more elements of dictionary as we go along. Let me stop there for today. Okay, great, thank you. Questions? I have a question. 
I feel like that's changed on the frequency omega for the low energy infringe, in, infringement that ensures that we can separate out the three um, action terms, open, interaction, and closed. So what you want is you want, so, so let, let me physically tell you what's happening. If you have very high energy projectiles, be they, be they dilatons or gravitons, they will not care that there is this throw, they'll just fall through. Okay. So, the, so, so if you think of, if you convert, if you basically try to write down the wave equation that a dilaton will obey in this geometry, you'll find that it will have a barrier, a potential barrier in an in a, in a effective Schrodinger sense. And that potential barrier will say that, you know, if you're, if you're above that barrier, you just fall through. But if you're below the barrier, you, you, you weakly tunnel through. Okay. For the absorption to work at low energies, you, you sort of, you want this, the, the barrier to be steep. Okay. And, and that's where this constraint comes from. That's where the sort of low energy constraint comes from. Okay, thank you so much. I have a question. Right. Could you please explain more how do you pass from the stack of deep brains with open strings to this um, closed string background picture? Yeah. So at this point, I only made the following observation. I made the observation that if I have NB3 brains here, then these D3 brains are charged under Ramon Ramon fields. They're charged under the Ramon Ramon 4 form in type 2B. And the, the fact that the N of them basically means that since they, they carry charge, they're like point sources, electrical sources for this Ramon Ramon 4 form. And if I want to measure how many D3 brains are there, I just use Gauss's law. I integrate over a transverse five sphere that encircles them. And that transverse five sphere gives me an answer N if there are N D3 brains. So think about it this way. These three brains, they, 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 they straddle a Minkowski space, for a four dimensional Minkowski space. Their transverse space is six dimensional. So they are point particles in six dimensions. And if I want to measure the electric flux, I just encircle them with a five sphere in the six dimensions and see how many flux lines cross that five sphere. Of course, for that flux lines to make sense, they have to be five form fluxes because otherwise, if I try to integrate a two form flux over a five sphere, I get zero. In this solution, we also have a solution with exactly the same, uh, we, can, we can work out the ADM energies, it's exactly the same ADM energies as, of, as, as described in, in 10 dimensions and the same flux through the five sphere. So this is the only statement I'm making so far. I'm identifying the two backgrounds simply based on macroscopic charges, okay? Now, there's a more sophisticated story to tell, but one which I don't know how to make work, but the story at least makes qualitative sense. So I'll say, say it here um, in the following way. If I were to describe string theory here in this picture, what I would do is I would describe string theory here in a world sheet sense. So let, let me copy this over and, and, and then try to draw something. I'll, I'll draw both pictures and, and say what I, what I want to say. I could think of world sheets, the string world sheets that contribute here as string world sheets that have boundaries because these are the boundaries where the D brains it. So I'm doing perturbative string in this setup. I'm supposed to do perturbative string with a fixed set of boundary conditions corresponding to where the D brains are. To go to the second picture, I want to do something else. I want to close these holes on the bound on the world sheet. 
and some only over closed Riemann surfaces, no boundaries. Okay. But closing the holes, the, the boundary states in 2D conformal field theory, they are coherent states. So closing the holes means exponentiating them. But from the world sheet point of view, there's, there, there's sources of graviton vertex operators. So there must be some statement which goes back, if, if I were to phrase it in, in, in technical string theory parlance, to some kind of fishless or kind Polchinski mechanism that closes these holes while for consistency change a geometry at the same time. Okay. So this has been the fantasy since the very early days of ADSCFT that the way this correspondence should be derived at the level of string theory is by starting with the open plus closed string description, integrating out the open strings and ending up with a pure closed string theory, but now with a modified background. The most interesting implementation of this idea that I know of is not in the physical string theory, it's in the topological string theory and refer you to the discussion of Uguri and Wafa in the context of trying to derive Gopakumar Wafa duality from um, uh, circa 2001 or 2002, I forget. Uh, if someone wants a reference, let me know. Um, but nobody, as far as I know, has managed to make this precise, starting with this particular picture of D3 brains in 10 dimensional string theory and showing that it actually gives you, after integrating out the open strings, ADS microsystem. Well. But morally speaking, this is how it should work, but that's not good enough. Okay, thank you. And just to make sure I understood the general feature, the first um, way of deriving that geometry that you described seems to hold only at low energies and to, to, have, to assume that the correspondence is only true at the level of macroscopic charges, while in this second case, this would also hold at a, at a microscopic level. Is that true or not? Um, well, Yes and no. So while I use the macroscopic charges to motivate the connection, I, I think the, the, corres the correspondence, the full correspondence can only see, uh, even to go from here to closing the holes, I need to somehow remove the excited open strings because otherwise I'm talking about not just the the Yang Mills degrees of freedom, but also the excitations of the open strings. So that's where there's one, that's one reason where one re area where there's a low energy constraint coming from. But the, uh, I don't think the macroscopic charges by themselves tell me that I'm looking at the low energy limit. What I think is true, I mean, okay. Let me say this. Way. If you keep the massive open strings as well, I think you will get a more, you'll get a more complicated theory here. It will not just be strings in ADS micros as well. Because I think string theory in ADS micros S5 should only keep track of the all the excitations of uh, n equals for super Yang Mills, the world volume theory of D three brains, not not the, the not the full open string spectrum. But I, I didn't give you a better. I, I can try, let me think about it and give you a better answer than that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions?
maybe I have one. Um, so can you repeat how you computed the absorption cross-section with uh, the DBI action? Is it just the interaction with, uh, with respect with the dilaton and the gauge fields or is it something else? No, it's just a dilaton on the gauge fields. So okay. um, I, I just use the fact that the dilaton is, uh, you know, th there's some classical vertex for a dilaton to take into two gauge components. And I just okay. use the standard classical vertex for that, that vertex to convert that into a absorption cross-section calculation. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, so maybe we can stop the recording and just let people keep asking questions without being recorded. Right.